Okay, we're going to go through the 2014 uh, physics regents exam, and we're just going to look at the part two questions. So I'm going to go through them pretty quick. Pause or rewind if I say anything too quickly, um, and let's go. So let's start with the questions 51 through 54. These are a vector question, and it says two forces, a 60 newton force east and an 80 newton force north, act concurrently on an object located at point P as shown. Okay, so we look in our answer booklet and we see a diagram there. So that's what they're talking about. And so on each one of these pages, I actually have the little excerpt from the, the test booklet and also the answer booklet right below it. So you'd have to look in two separate booklets to see where you'd write your answers. But let's read through. And now they ask us to use a ruler to determine the scale used for the vector diagram. So this is pretty simple. Um, in order to figure out what scale was used, either vector can be measured from tip to tail. So we measure this full length. This is eight centimeters from end to end. And if we measured our 60, it would be six centimeters from end to end. And so no work needed because this is a single point question. But if you set it up as a proportion, it's pretty easy to see that eight centimeters uh, is equal to 80 newtons. And then to answer how many newtons are in one centimeter, we just put one centimeter on the bottom of our second fraction. And, you know, leave an unknown on top. And hopefully you'd either cross multiply or you can just quick see that this is 10 newtons for every one centimeter. And that would be true for the, the six centimeter side as well. Okay, now question 52 says, draw the resultant force vector to scale on your diagram in your answer booklet. Label the vector R. And so to do that, let's get rid of some of the stuff I put on here already. Um, what you would want to do is remind yourself that adding vectors together means that we move them tip to tail. And so if I took this vertical vector, oops, it's a little crooked there. Here we go. Okay. And I took that and I moved it over so that its tail was at the 60s tip. Or I would take the 60 and do the same thing. I could take that 60 from the bottom and redraw it up top. Duplicate this, slide it up. I know you can't slide these around, but what you could do is just literally take a ruler and draw a nice horizontal line up top. Make it as long as you want it to be, perfectly horizontal. And you could do the same thing with a vertical line. And draw these lightly because these are not the answer of the question. Just draw that straight up and you'd see where those two lines intersect. Where they intersect, that's where your resultant goes to. And so your resultant should also be drawn with a ruler, okay? And it should go from point P and just finish exactly where they intersect. And make sure you label that with a capital R like they show in the instructions. And so you either leave those little lightly drawn guides that you had, or you could erase them. Either one would be fine, as long as you clearly label your vector. And now for 53, it says determine the magnitude of the resultant force. So you could take your ruler and now measure the length of that new resultant vector. This is 10 centimeters long. And since that's 10 centimeters and each one is a Newton, this is 100 Newtons. Um, there's another way to do this. And hopefully you can quickly see that there is a right triangle that you've now drawn. That right triangle, we know two of the sides, right? So here we, I'm going to do it in pink. You could have the top triangle as well. And that means that this bottom edge being 60 and the top, uh, or I should say upright side, the, the height of this is 80. And so you can use Pythagorean theorem. And our resultant, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, r squared equals 60 squared plus 80 squared. And you'd end up squaring that, and then you take your square root of both sides, and r, once again, comes out to be 100 newtons. And finally, we want to measure this angle. And question 54, one thing you have to be careful about is that it, me it says measure the angle in degrees between north and the resultant force. So this between north is important. So we got to go down to our diagram. We're going to look at where north is. North is this vertical here. 
and we want that angle between there and the resultant. So here, this is the angle we're looking for. This is what they want to know. And so we'll take our protractor, I'm going to put one on screen, and we have to slide it so that the intersection, the little hole that's in the center, the, the vertex of our angle, goes right where P is. And we need that zero, this is an important thing, zero should be right on, so here's zero on my protractor, should be right on that north line. And then we're going to go over and count across. We're at 30, 35, 36, 37. Looks like we're at about 38. And so now that we're at counting an angle of 38, we would put that as an answer, 38 degrees. And actually the, the answer booklet said it was 37, but that's okay because the answer booklet says it's 37 plus or minus two degrees. And so our 38 is right in there, be perfect one point full credit. Okay, so hopefully that helps you with some vector stuff. Let's go to the next question. The next question is question 5556. Now, first off, 5556, and the answer booklet shows it the same way. That just means that it's a two-point question. It's still really only asking you one thing, but you have to show all work, including equation and substitution with units. So let me show you what that means as we go through this problem. So... A three Newton force causes a spring to stretch 60 centimeters. Calculate the spring constant of this spring. And so since they're asking us for spring constant, we gotta know what that is. That's from our mechanics units. That's K for spring constant. And they're giving us a force. So this is actually our spring force, okay? So this is FS. And we should remember that FS equals KX. All right, so Right there, writing that out, that's part of this two-point uh, question. You have to write your equation. So there, we've done that. And the next step is substitution with units. So we have three newtons of force. So there, for our force, we put in three newtons. Don't forget, units. And we're looking for spring constant, K. So let's leave K. That's nothing. We don't know it. And then we have to plug in our stretch length, that's 60 centimeters. And we can convert that, or let's leave it at 60 right now, and I'll talk a little bit about whether we convert or not. And we put our units. And so that's substitution with units. Doing that is our second point. We just did everything needed to get plus one on this, even though we don't have an answer. So that's plus one point for that 55. And now to get the next point, you don't actually have to show any more work. You could just plug this in your calculator, but I'm gonna do a little more. I'm just gonna put on screen that we're dividing both sides by 60. And so now we'll take our calculator out. We'll take three divided by 60. And this is 0 0.05. And we have to have our units correct. This is Newtons per centimeter. Okay, and that's K and that's our answer. And I'll put equals K and I'll box my answer. And now that was our second point. And now I just wanna talk a little bit about whether we had to convert or not. You didn't have to convert for this one, but I always recommend to my students that they do convert into meters because some constants that we use from our reference table have things like meters and seconds and um, kilograms in them. So we like to use everything with our base units. So although this got full credit, uh, a safer way to solve this would be to use spring force equals kx, and then we'd say three newtons equals k, and our x, we'd put 0.6 meters. And at this point, you should feel pretty confident converting centimeters to meters. That's one that's that's pretty common on the, the, uh, the Regents exam. And then we divide both sides by 0.6, and we get that five newtons per meter equals k. And so those are two, um, Again, plus one for our equation and substitution with units and plus one again for the correct answer. Two different ways to get that point. Just notice your number has to match your units and this five has to match with the meters. So depending on if you've converted or not, okay? So let's go to the next question. 57, a single point question. Uh, let's read through a seven 
0.28 kilogram bowling ball traveling at 8.5 meters per second east collides head on with a mother bowling ball traveling 10 meters per second west. Determine the magnitude of the total momentum of the two ball system after the collision. So they're asking us about total momentum. We know that momentum is P and P is found with the formula P equals MV. Again, one point, so no work needed, but I'm gonna do something as I read these problems. You know, sometimes it's helpful for a problem solving strategy to draw little sketches. So the seven kilogram ball is traveling to the east. So let's draw that ball. And let's show it traveling east. And then the five kilogram ball is traveling to the west. So let's show that traveling west. And the reason why I think this is helpful is because momentum is a vector. And so these directions matter. And so when we find MV for this, what I've drawn in orange, and we add on MV for what's drawn in red, because the red is traveling west, that's going to be a negative vector. And we're going to end up subtracting these two momentums. Um, and you can just plug in our numbers now, 7.28 times 8.5. And you can either add this and use a negative velocity vector, or you could just say we subtract them. Um, but both will end up giving you the same answer in the end. And I'll say negative 10 meters per second. And so just like before, now we got all our numbers. Again, no work needed on paper. You're not getting graded for your work. But we put in our 7.28 times 8.5, say delete, uh, plus 5.45 times negative 10. And we get our answer of 7.38. And hopefully you remember momentum is kilogram times meters per second. Now, where is that coming from? Well from the formula, right? We had mass, which is kilogram, and we had velocity, which is meters per second. But you don't need to know it because all you have to put is 7.38 because they're giving you your units. So there you go. Got another answer there. Let's see what the next one is. This is 58.59, so it's a two-point question. We know we have to show all our work. Calculate the average power required to lift a 490 Newton object a vertical distance of two meters in 10 seconds. So power, power is also P just like momentum was, but this is a capital P. And so there's a few formulas for power on our reference table, but because they've given us a weight, a distance and a time, we're gonna use the force times distance divided by time part of the power formula. Now there's other parts that we just don't need right now. And so we'll say power equals, again, we're showing all our work, including our substitution, 490 newtons times two meters divided by 10 seconds. And we plug all of this into our calculator. 490 times two divided by 10, and we get 98. And so our power equals 98 and we have to remember that our units are watts for power. Now, if you totally forgot what your units were, you are technically allowed to just use the units from the problem prior to, you know, uh, when you substituted everything in. So technically, a Newton times meters divided by seconds, that's allowed. And that is what a watt actually is. So if you're ever lost and you're like, I don't forget what the units are, you just use the units that all got substituted in, and that will save you a point. All right, let's see what's next. Oh, I like this one. This is a nice quick one, if you remember what diffraction is. So we read the question. It says, the diagram in your answer booklet shows wave fronts approaching opening in a barrier. So what are wave fronts? I like, these are the wave fronts, these vertical lines, they're waves, okay? And the way I think of wave fronts is imagine a drone flying above the beach. These wave fronts are the tops of every wave that's headed towards the shore. And they're, they're all crashing towards the shore to the right in this picture. And now these wave fronts, right? These are wave fronts. Um, they're going through this opening. And when they come out the other side, they end up creating these arched um, waves. And that's because the waves if I drew the direction of the waves, well, every wave 
on the left side is just traveling in a straight line to the right. But as they go through the opening, the middle goes straight, but the waves that are right on the edge bend outward. And that's what diffraction is. It's bending of waves as those waves pass barriers. Okay, so you can see that there is this bending upward. But that's not needed for this question. Let's get rid of all the directions of our waves. And all we need are the three wave fronts, nice curves on the right side of the barrier. Plus one point for your test. Okay, let's see what's next. Okay, question 61. The diagram in your answer booklet shows a mechanical transverse wave traveling to the right in a medium. Point A represents a particle in the medium. Draw the arrow originating at point A to indicate the in initial direction that particle will move as the wave continues to travel to the right in the medium. So transverse waves mean that the particles travel either up or down as the wave travels to the side. Okay, That sideways motion and that up and down motion, that's reminding us of the T in transverse. Okay, So A can only go up or down. There's no other uh, arrow that makes sense other than an up arrow or a down arrow. And is it up or down? The way we think about this, the way we realize which way it's going, is if this wave, which I'm now highlighting in red, travels to the right, I slide it over a little bit, there's where it's going to be in, in a fraction of a second. Well, A, in order to still be part of this wave, has to move from being here to now being up there, because it's going to head towards the top of that crest as it moves towards where A is. And so that means that that's the direction that A will move. So we're going to, on A, draw an arrow straight up. That's it. It should be attached to A. We get rid of these dotted lines below. There's your answer. Full credit. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's see what's next. 62. Um, this is kind of a conceptual question, so it takes maybe a careful read to understand what's going on. Let's read through. Regardless of the method used to generate electrical energy, the amount of energy provided by the source is always greater than the amount of electrical energy produced. Explain why there is a difference between the amount of energy provided by the source and the amount of electrical energy produced. So, how do we produce energy? We got a whole bunch of different ways. We could be um, running a generator, right? You can put gasoline into a generator. It could run a motor, and that motor can spin an actual uh, electric generator, right? Something like an alternator. Uh, we have wind farms. They have giant windmills that spin, and inside the windmill, we have these wind turbines. Uh, these these electrical motors that, when they're spun, create electricity. In both of those cases the gasoline has more energy than the electric we get out, right? We can do, we can get electric that we can do work with, but it's less than the energy stored in the actual gasoline molecules. And the same is true for the wind. There's more energy in the wind itself than the electricity that we get out of the wind farm. So they're not perfectly efficient. And the reason is because all of these systems have some sort of loss of energy. And so Loss of energy is the reason, but they want to know specific what kind of loss there is. So um, we could just say that energy is lost. And I'm going to say in the form of thermal energy. Because all of these systems have friction. And friction creates thermal or internal energy, okay? Uh, you could say heat loss. You could say even sound, right? When you run that generator and it sounds like a loud motor running, well, that sound wave had to come from some sort of energy. And that energy is coming from, you know, burning that gasoline. And if there's sound traveling to your ear, then that's energy that wasn't going out in electrical, electrical form. So there you go. Okay, we got a graph question. We're gonna see. Um, we have this velocity and time graph for a car moving along a straight line. Okay, so what I want you to understand first off is that a velocity graph 
is just telling you how fast the car is going. So time equals zero, velocity is zero. That means time equals zero, it's not moving. It's starting from rest. And as we look at this, well, at different intervals, well, we're going at five meters per second and then 10 meters per second and then 15 meters per second. That range of time from zero to six seconds means we're getting faster. And then over here, we're at 15 and still 15 and continuing at 15 and 15 and ending at 15. So that velocity is constant at the end. And that means our speed is constant. We're not speeding up or slowing down. Okay. And just looking at the graph, you should understand that. Okay. And we know that all of our velocity graphs are always going to have straight lines on them just because of the types of motion that we study in Regents physics. Okay. So hopefully you got a quick overview of the graph. Let's read what they're asking us. Determine the magnitude of the average velocity of the car from six to 10 seconds. So from six to 10 seconds, this is kind of nice from six to 10 seconds, this whole time, well, the speed of the car is not changing. We're 15 and staying at 15. There's nothing to average. If you average 15 with 15 and 15 and you average all those things together, the average is 15 because it was always 15. And so no calculation to do, just understanding the question and understanding what the graph is showing. Now, 64, determine the magnitude of the car's acceleration during this first six seconds. So the first six seconds, we've got to make sure we're looking at the right part of the graph. Um, we're studying this part of our motion, right? All the way up until actually six seconds. So it's past five. And that's this line, this sloped line. Okay? It's got a slant to it. And hopefully we remember that the slope of a velocity graph is acceleration. But if you forgot that the slope is acceleration, you could just say, all right, we're trying to determine the acceleration. And there's a formula. Acceleration is change. That's a delta, not a, a change in velocity over t. So we could say, all right, how much did our velocity change? Well, we went from zero, and then at the end, we're at 15. We changed by 15 meters per second. Now, how much time did that take? That took six seconds. And when you take 15 divided by six, you get 2.5, okay? Now, that is the slope. And you could see that because slope is change in y over change in x. And when we look at our graph, when we found our change in velocity, that was a change in y, right? It was going up 15. And when we figured out the time, that was a change in x. It was going to the right six seconds. And so we actually did find a slope. And you could do that slope formula with any of them. So I could say, all right, what's my change in y divided by change in x to go from 0 to 5? And my change in y was a change of 5 meters per second. And my time in that case, the slope change in my time was two seconds, five divided by two, also 2.5. So a couple of different ways to think about it. I think the more, um, the deeper your understanding, if you have more uh, strategies and understand how formulas connect to graphs. And finally, 65 says, identify this physical quantity represented by the shaded area on the graph. So shaded area on this graph is the area from that line, that velocity line, down to your x-axis. This, this whole kind of little shape here. To find what the area of any graph means, all you have to do is say, all right, what is my y-axis times my x-axis, and does it have meaning? Well, velocity is my y-axis. My x-axis is time. Is there something that velocity times time tells me? And if you remember what velocity formula is, it's displacement divided by time. When you cross multiply that, displacement is equal to velocity times time. And so that's the answer here, displacement. And they would also accept distance or how far the car traveled or anything that indicates that you understand its distance. Now, um, this is not part of this question. I'm just going to leave it up to you and try and um, give you one little additional thing to, to understand. It's not on this Regents exam, but on past Regents exams, they might say, calculate the distance based on this graph. And how would you do that? Well, I'd like you to try it and see if you could figure it out. Well, we would find the area, this actual value of this area to do that. You need to split it into both a triangle over here on the left, and that has a formula for area of one half base times height, and then add on this rectangle so you know 
the entire area, right? This rectangle has an area of whatever the rectangle's base is times its height, and take the area of the triangle plus the rectangle. That would be your total displacement. So we're not going to do that now, but if you can do that, that's, that's a good practice problem for another Regents exam. Let's see what's next. All right, this tells us a student constructed a series circuit consisting of a 12 volt battery, a 10 ohm lamp, and a resistor. The circuit does not contain a voltmeter or an ammeter. When the circuit is operating, the total current through the circuit is 0.5 amps. Okay, they tell us 66. In the space in your answer booklet, draw a diagram of the series circuit constructed to operate the lamp using sim symbols from your reference table. So they tell us we've got a battery. Here's our 12 volt battery. You don't have to label it with 12 volts, but I think it's helpful, so I'm gonna do it. And then you have to know what a lamp is. You look on your reference table, it's a little coily, squiggly line with a circle around it, and there's a lamp. And then it said in series, so we only have one loop, and here's our resistor, a little zigzag, and then it goes back. One single loop with a lamp and a resistor. Again, you don't have to label these, but it does tell us that it's a 10 ohm lamp. So I think this is helpful for our problem solving. So I'm gonna add it into my drawing. And um, then we're gonna read the next part. That's full credit, whether you had those labels there or not. Um, 67 says, determine the equivalent resistance of the circuit. So unnecessary, but I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna put a little verb table. Um, and I want to, the reason I'm doing this is because I think it's easier for me to explain, but I'm gonna put resistor, and then I'm gonna put R for lamp. Lamps have resistance, right? That's why there's 10 ohms. And then I'm gonna draw a little line, and I'm gonna put my equivalent resistance. And that's what they're asking um, for 67. They're asking, what is the equivalent resistance? So I should put this 67 in orange, is asking for this box. Okay, now we only know the resistance of the lamp, and we know that there's 12 volts in this circuit. Okay, now how are we going to find what this unknown is? Well, they told us that the current in the circuit, and if there's current in the circuit coming out of the battery of 0.5 amps, our rule for series circuit is that 0.5 is also going through the lamp, 0.5 is also going through the resistor and 0.5 is also coming back to the battery because there's only one path for that current. And so that means there's 0.5 amps everywhere. And that's something they expect you to be able to like understand and know that they gave you 0.5. And that means every resistor also has 0.5. Is it necessary to fill in the chart? No, but I think it's a good problem solving technique. And that lets us now look at this bottom row and say, hey, we have two things and we can find resistance using Ohm's law. V equals IR and 12 equals 0.5 R. No units because I'm just doing this for scratch work because it's not a two point question. And 12 divided by 0.5 comes out to be 24 ohms. And so there we go, 24. That's our equivalent resistance. Now they ask for 68, what is the resistance of the resistor? And now that we see our chart, this makes 68 super easy. We know that there's a rule for resistors in series that when we add these two resistors, the unknown that we have here, plus 10 has to add up to 24. That tells us that this is a 14 ohm resistor. So just by being a little bit careful about our setup at the beginning of our problem, we can get quicker, easier answers later on. And then 6970, this is one where you're asked to show some procedure. And now they're asking us to calculate the power consumed. So power consumed, but by the lamp, that's the important part. So lots of people say, oh, power, and then they just jump in and they say, power equals VI, and they say V is 12, and current is 0.5, because those are the things that are given in the problem. But this is not what they're asking, because that's the voltage of your total circuit times the current in your total circuit. That's the total power if you did that. But they're asking for the power of the lamp. And so we're gonna go here. This is what the question's really asking. 
And so again, by having that chart there and realizing you're solving for a different row, you're not just plugging in numbers from the problem into equations. And so now, well, we could figure out what the voltage used by the resistor is or the lamp or the lamp and the resistor. But instead, since we have current and we have resistance, we can use the power formula that is with current and resistance. So P equals I squared R. And you should know in your electricity section where the power formula is. And there's um, multiple different ways to calculate power depending on what's given in the problem. And so now we get to say, well, we have 0.5 amps squared. And the resistance, we already know the lamp has a resistance of 10 ohms. And now we just got our one point for this two point question. There's an equation, yes, and substitution with units. Substitution with units, that's plus one, even without the right answer. And then we do our math, we could plug it in our calculator, or this one should be pretty quick and easy. We have power equals 0.25 times 10, which tells me power equals 2.5 watts. Okay, and there's your answer. Did you have to show this step? No, not at all. I was just doing it because that helped me do some mental math. And we got plus one for both of our points on a part two question or a two point question. So let's move on to the next group of questions. This is 71 through 75. Okay, this one's a little complicated to read. Um, and I think a nice strategy when we have a lot of numbers in a problem and these big scientific notation numbers is just to read it and just say, um, don't read the numbers themselves because they can kind of get in the way of understanding what they're trying to tell us. So I'm going to read it without the numbers. Let's see. Pluto orbits the sun at an average, dist average distance of this. Pluto's diameter is this other number and its mass is something else. Okay. Notice how I just kind of like, all right, now I know we've got average distance, we've got diameter, and we've got mass. But I didn't have to read those numbers and like, jam myself up and my understanding of what they're trying to give me. Okay. Chiron or, or orbits Pluto with their centers separated by a distance of this number. Chiron has a diameter of this number and a mass of something else. Great. So we've got all these values for Pluto going around the sun. So maybe, maybe I could even do a quick, quick sketch. Here's the sun, right? Here's Pluto out here, I'll label it as a P. And then there's something going around Pluto. That's this, I'm putting a little orbit there. And that's C for Chiron. This is do Pluto here, it's a little bit bigger and that's going around the sun here. That gives me a quick little, okay, this is what they're talking about. Great. They wanna calculate the magnitude of the gravitational force of attraction that Pluto exerts on Chiron. So, we are going to talk about gravitational force. This is big G, M1, M2 over R squared. Now, big G is a constant. It's on our reference table. It's on the first page. Um, and I'm actually going to look it up right now because since this is a two-point question, um, you do need the units for big G. And so let's write those in. It's 6.67, and I don't have these units memorized. I copied them straight off the reference table. It's newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared. Okay, that's what big G is. Now, mass one, this is the mass of Pluto. So we look up, and we know it gave it to us. Now we can actually go back and, and read the mass of Pluto. Uh, so let me do this in pink, since pink was for Pluto. There's our mass of Pluto. And so... 1.31 times 10 to the 22, and we have to put our kilograms. And then Chiron um, has its own mass, there it is. And we plug that in, 1.55 times 10 to the 21, 21 kilograms. And then we need the distance between them. And so, let's see, distance between them is 1.96 times 10 to the 7 and this is meters and do not forget that that is squared and if you forget that you'll get the calculation wrong 
but we have to now plug this into our calculator. This is not a very friendly calculation to make on our calculator. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about how I use my calculator to solve this. You've seen this in class before, if you've had class with me. 6.67 second E. Oh no, I left out my scientific notation. Sorry about that. If you were copying off your own reference table, you probably were yelling at the screen. This is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. There we go. I was too busy worried about my units. So negative 11 times 1.31 second E 22 times 1.55 second E 21 divided by, we put our distance, 1.9696 second E7, and then we can square that even without parentheses, because when you use that scientific notation, that EE -E button, um, it handles all of those parentheses for you, and hit enter, and here we have 3.53 times 10 to the 18, and this is a force, so this is Newton's. A lot of places to make errors, a lot of writing, but ultimately still just a plug and chug question. Now, 7374, calculate the magnitude of acceleration of Chiron toward Pluto. Now, a lot of people see acceleration and they say, oh, it's going in a circle. I want to use centripetal acceleration. That's V squared over R. This is great. We do have R. We don't have V squared or V. We don't even know how fast it's going. So this is kind of a dead end that won't get us our answer. And so we also have to know that um, gravitational field strength, G, is an acceleration. And that's just FG divided by M. And so if we're doing FG divided by M, what we do have FG. We just found it. We plug that in. So this is, again, it's a two-point question. So we have to show our full work. This is 3.53 times 10 to the 18 newtons divided by the mass of Chiron, which we have 1.55 times 10 to the 21st kilograms. And now G equals, let's plug those two into our calculator. Um, it's the last thing I had from the previous problem, so that makes it easy. I just hit the divide button. It keeps, they put A and S, that means it's taking the previous answer. No rounding needed, so that's great. It'll have the exact answer. And we're dividing by 1.55 second E21. Here we are with a acceleration of 0 0.0023. And this is meters per second squared. An acceptable, another acceptable unit would also be like above newtons per kilogram. That would also be acceptable because those are correct units. They're equivalent to each other. And there we have an answer. And then finally, this asks us to state the reason why the magnitude of the sun's gravitational force on Pluto is greater than the sun's gravitational force on Chiron. Well, when you look at this, some people say, oh, Pluto must be closer. But sometimes Chiron's closer. Sometimes it's farther. It's going around. And so it's not about the distance. Um, it's about the fact that Pluto's mass is much greater than Chiron. So we're going to say that Pluto's mass is greater than Chiron. There we go. And that's it. They want ma greater mass. Uh, they do point out specifically that if you say it's larger, that's not correct because size, as far as like radius, does not matter. It's mass that's the important thing. All right, let's see our next question. Uh, a horizontal 20 Newton force is applied to a five kilogram box to push it across a rough horizontal floor at a constant velocity of three meters per second to the right. Determine the magnitude of force of friction acting on the box. Most people see force of friction go straight to the friction formula, which is actually the right thing to do. It's a good thought. The problem they see right away is that, wait a second, 
they must have forgot to tell us something. We don't know what our coefficient of friction is because they didn't tell us, is it, is it wood on wood? Is it steel on steel? And without the coefficient of friction, this formula will not help us get the answer. So maybe another strategy you should do is just drawing a quick picture. What's happening here? We got this thing. We're applying a force. So let's do our applied force in 20 newtons in purple. And you have to realize that they're giving us this little special hidden given constant velocity and as soon as you see there's a constant velocity you need to know this is equilibrium if you're in equilibrium then all forces have to add up to zero and there has to be a force of friction that's exactly equal to that applied force and so no calculation needed there's 20 newtons of friction and the reason it's moving is because, well, maybe to get it moving, somebody pushed a little harder than 20. They got it moving. And then they backed off to keep it moving at a constant speed. And that's, that's what's going on here. Now, calculate the weight of the box. You have to know that weight is Fg. And so it's a two-point question, a nice and easy one. Fg equals Mg. They gave us the mass, 5 kilograms. And we know G is a constant here on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. And so we plug in our units on both of those. We wrote our equation. We've got plus one, even if we calculate this wrong accidentally. But this comes out to be 49 Newtons. And now we've got our weight, our full two points for this problem. And if we know that that is 49, when we go to 79, Calculate the coefficient of friction, uh, kinetic friction, coefficient of kinetic friction. Um, people saw this word kinetic and got a little confused. It's not kinetic energy. They're talking about the coefficient of kinetic friction. This is mu. Um, this is pretty easy because we know we can use this formula now to find that mu. Force of friction equals mu Fn. Force of friction, 20 newtons. Mu is what we're looking for. We just need to know our normal force. How much force is the floor pushing up on the box? Well, it has to be exactly equal to whatever the weight is. And that turns out to be 49 newtons. We already calculated it. They kind of set us up for that. They knew we would need it. So they asked us to calculate it in a previous step. And so we plug that in, 49 newtons. When we divide through, again, you don't have to show the division. You can just do this step on your calculator, but you find out that 0.4 equals mu and no units for coefficient of friction. It's a unitless number. So if you did put a unit after the 0.4, you actually would lose points for units because you need to know that it has no units. Okay, and we're up to our last one or last set, I should say. An electron traveling with a speed of 2.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second collides with a fo photon having frequency of 1 times 10 to the 16 hertz. After the collision, the photon has 3.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules of energy. Calculate the original kinetic energy of the electron. All right, kinetic energy, we've got one formula for that, Ke equals 1 half mv squared. So one half now we need the mass of an electron if you look on the front page of your reference table they don't just say mass they say rest mass of electrons and it is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms okay and then the velocity they gave us in the problem here's our velocity and we put 2.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Don't forget to square it. We plug those numbers into our calculator. I'm going to put this in as a 0.5 times 9.11 second e negative 31 times 2.5 second e6 and I'm going to square that. Hit enter and we get energy of 2.85 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, because this is an energy. 
we've got our kinetic energy. Two points. Now determine the energy lost by the photon during the collision. So how are we going to figure that out? Oh wait, I skipped one. Determine the energy in joules of the photon before the collision. So before the collision, they give us its frequency. So there's its frequency, F. And there's a formula for energy of a photon. You don't have to show this, but it's frequency times, or um, Planck's constant. It doesn't matter the order, but Planck's constant times frequency. And so all you have to do is find Planck's constant, plug it into your calculator. I'm not going to put my units here because it's not a two-point question. So Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. And the frequency they gave us was 1 times 10 to the 16 hertz. Plug those two numbers into our calculator. 6.63 second e, negative 34 times 1, second e, 16, and we get 6.63 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Now, after the collision, there's only this many joules. So we have to take that answer we just had and subtract the joules after. You started with 6.63, now we got 3.18, or what, what did we lose to get to that? So it's already in my calculator, the 6.63. All we do is subtract 3.18 second e, negative 18. And the difference between them is 3.45 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. And now in all collisions, well, what things are conserved? You can put a whole bunch of things. Um, I'm gonna give you a few. You could say energy. You could say mass. You could say momentum. You could say charge. Um, all of these things are always conserved, okay? Um, you know, we can lose energy. We saw a problem where we're converting energy into electrical energy, and it said, well, why is there always less? There's less because energy can be lost, but it's lost into the environment. It's not lost from the universe. It's not destroyed. And so these are four good answers. You only needed to pick two of them to get full credit for this. And I hope that helps understand these part two questions, and good luck on your readings exam.